is it your sense that these this is sort of a charge of convenience it allows the government to hang on to these people until they can figure out if in fact they have any relationship to this well in some cases it is but they are obligated under the law to uh, uh, place those people uh, in uh, detention under those INS laws uh, if they're found to uh, to be in the country illegally but in cases where they think they have someone who is a good lead uh, they they will use that and it's been done before Aaron. Mike thanks Mike Betcher in Atlanta is working the investigative side of this we have more on that uh, but we need to quickly go to our senior White House correspondent John King because there is yet another breaking development there John well, Aaron, I wish we could tell you exactly what we have before us, but this has been a very confusing day here. We have had the security perimeter stretched out beyond the White House yet again. And just a few moments ago, out of the old executive office building, and we can show you a picture of it, came some Secret Service personnel. That is a robotic vehicle that is part of the Secret Service bomb squad. Now, it has sat inside the gate since it came out a few moments ago, so we're not trying to alarm anybody here. But this on a day in which the White House reestablished a much wider security perimeter around the White House, for the past several hours, a helicopter with a searchlight has been flying over the premises, shining down a searchlight on the streets around the White House. That vehicle just, oh, 45, 50 yards from me through a fence between the White House and the old executive office building. And again, we don't want to get anyone out of control here. It came out. The officers are still sitting there. But it, uh, yet again, another sign of the extraordinary stepped up security around the White House tonight. This on a day in which we saw the president out in public trying to reassure the American people. Tomorrow he will attend a national prayer service, ask the nation to pause for a moment of silence. That part of the president's effort to get the country to look forward in a more reassuring mode. But the developments around here today, a signal that this crisis will go on for some time to come. The president choked up as he discussed the enormity of the challenge ahead. I think about the families, the children. Um, I'm, a, I'm a loving guy. And I'm also someone, however, who's got a job to do. And I intend to do it. Two days after the attacks, discussions with top security advisors include talk of retaliatory strikes followed by a sustained international diplomatic and financial crackdown against suspected terrorists and their supporters. Now's an opportunity to do uh, generations a favor by coming together and whipping terrorism, hunting it down, finding it, and holding them accountable. Uh, the nation must understand this is now the focus of my administration. Sources say military planners are discussing options for retaliating against the lead suspect, Saudi terrorist Osama bin Laden. But one senior official said the administration was waiting to act because, quote, there might be not one, but multiple organizations involved in this. Another served notice that when the administration does act, it will not be a one-time affair. You don't do it with just a single military strike no matter how dramatic you don't do it with just military forces alone you do it with the full resources of the u.s government it will be a campaign not a single action the president and first lady took time to visit some of those injured in the attack on the pentagon and mr bush called governor george pataki and mayor rudy giuliani to announce he will travel to new york on friday to get a first-hand look at the worst of the devastation but this interfered with the white house effort to project a reassuring image the security perimeter around the White House suddenly expanded because of new concerns of a terrorist attack. Vice President Cheney left the White House and was rushed to the Camp David presidential retreat so that he and the president would not be at the same location. Now these new and constantly changing security precautions here at the White House, part of what one of the president's closest advisors called, quote, a transforming event for us and for the country. And Aaron, what the president himself labeled earlier today, the first war of the 21st century. Well, you have this, whatever this is going on on the White House grounds now with the, uh, the suspicions. You have the Capitol uh, evacuated late this afternoon, early this evening. You have a city that is absolutely on edge where everything is taken seriously. There's very similar scenes in New York going on. Uh, how does the president, how does the White House, how does anyone in Washington suggest the American people that things are getting back to normal? 
That is an enormous challenge, Aaron, and they recognize that here at the White House. The president himself has personally tried to script the prayer service that will be held when he is in New York tomorrow, trying to offer reassuring signals to the public. But every time the White House tries to cast a more reassuring image, we have a recurrence of events like this. I want to emphasize we see the robot from the bomb squad out here on the facilities, but still people, reporters, anyone with a White House pass, free to come and go. So obviously not a crisis atmosphere, but you're right. The president, on the one hand, offering reassuring words today. Hours later, they say National Airport will be closed indefinitely because of its proximity to the White House and the Pentagon. A very tough challenge for this president, not only in the days ahead, but they know it here at the White House in the weeks and months ahead as well. I expect they do. John, thanks. Senior White House correspondent John King. Secretary of State today, by the way, was not mincing any words at all. He was pointing fingers and demanding cooperation. There was none of the nuance that one usually sees in the business of diplomacy. Andrea Koppel covers the State Department. She joins us now. It was quite a remarkable briefing, wasn't it, in that way? It certainly was, Aaron. As you say, uh, quite unusual for folks in this building. But that wasn't the only thing unusual that happened today on the diplomatic front. Certainly when you consider the very delicate way, the very careful way the U.S. has been dealing with getting information from the Yemeni government. That was uh, the last attack against Americans last year, uh, the USS Cole in Yemen. Now fast forward 48 hours to the very public way that the folks in this building have been dealing with the government of Pakistan. <laughs> Tightening the diplomatic screws on Pakistan's president, the Bush administration presented a list of specific steps it says Pakistan must take. Among them, to share information on what it knows about Tuesday's attacks and Osama bin Laden's terrorist network, to close the border between Pakistan and Afghanistan and cut off fuel shipments, and eventually to provide the United States with use of Pakistani airspace if needed. We haven't yet publicly identified the organization we believe was responsible. But when you look at the list of candidates, uh, one resides in that region. Later, when pressed by reporters... When you spoke of the candidate who resides in that region, were you speaking of Osama bin Laden? Yes. For the first time, Powell saying publicly what many have said privately, that bin Laden's network, based in Afghanistan, is a prime suspect. And as Afghanistan's neighbor and longtime supporter, Pakistan could play a critical role in finding bin Laden and shutting down his terrorist training camps for good. Following another full day of intense meetings and conversations between U.S. and Pakistani officials, President Musharraf assured the Bush administration of Pakistan's unstinted cooperation in the fight against terrorism. He said Pakistan is ready to commit all of its resources to locate and punish those responsible for the attacks in New York and Washington. President Musharraf is in a difficult position. He has aided the Taliban. Uh, for, for a number of years. Uh, but also he needs the United States very badly right now. Uh, uh, we are improving our relations with India. Uh, he can't afford, I think, to antagonize the United States. State Department officials say early indications from Pakistan are, quote, very positive. Still, Secretary of State Powell acknowledged that with economic sanctions in place, the U.S. has very little leverage to turn up the heat. But Powell also said that the U.S. could make life a lot easier for Pakistan, Aaron, if that government cooperates. Andrea, help me with this a little bit, because after these incidents, and I don't care where they happen, governments always condemn them and they say they're terrible and they're not going to allow it to go on. And then it goes on and on again, and it's the same players. So why does what Pakistan says now, how should it, why should it be seen in any different way if, in fact, it should be? Well, certainly the, you're absolutely right to say that you, it's one thing to say something rhetorically, it's another thing to back that with action. And, and the U.S. is by no means saying that they are writing the end of this chapter right now. What they are saying is that they're hearing things publicly and, and privately from General Musharraf and other Pakistani officials that are encouraging. Now they'll see whether or not they're backed with action. So it's private things we'd like to hear, I guess. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you for your work today. Um, from the State Department, we move on to the Pentagon. Thousands 
Think about this. Thousands of reserves could be called to action in the wake of the incidents on Tuesday, that tragedy to relieve the National Guard troops who are now on air patrol over the United States. The president has to make that decision. Our military affairs correspondent, Jamie McIntyre, has more. He joins us tonight from the Pentagon. Jamie, good evening. Well, Pentagon officials are trying to make two things perfectly clear. One is it is the president's decision. It's not a Pentagon decision. And two, that decision has not yet been made. Nevertheless, Pentagon sources are telling us that the Bush administration is considering calling up thousands of reservists to uh, bolster the U.S. military strength. Some of those would be used to fly and, uh, and service the combat air patrols and some of the planes that are on strip alert around the country. Now, Secretary Rumsfeld canceled the combat, uh, uh, the fighter jet flights over most metropolitan areas, but he's left the planes flying in the New York to Washington corridor for now. In addition, at 26 bases across the United States, planes, fighter planes are on 15-minute strip alert. That means the pilots have to be nearby and ready to take off within 15 minutes in case there was a threat to the United States. Now, those planes are flown by Air National Guard and uh, National Guard troops, and uh, they've been at it for a, a day or so now, two days now, and the... Uh, Pentagon is looking at how they might give them some relief by calling up some of the reserves. They also might use some of these troops to just uh, to bolster the efforts at uh, disaster relief as well. Uh, have, have we have you heard anything from uh, the other side of town from over at the White House that gives you any reason one way or another to know what the president will do or when the president might do it? Well, I think a lot depends on uh, a if they decide to continue to keep these fighter jets on on alert. Uh, keeping ships at sea. I mean, that is designed to make sure the United States is protected and also to reassure the American public, but um, frankly, it's somewhat symbolic, so they might want to stand that down. If they do carry out this ca uh, campaign, this broader campaign that the United States keeps talking about against terrorism, then that will require reservists. The way the U.S. military is organized these days, no major military action can be done without reservists who have specialties in particular areas. That's basically the way the war plan works. And uh, just, uh, and I assume that's because as the military has gotten smaller, right? I mean, the military is just smaller Absolutely than right. it once was. Yeah, as, as they did that, they, the plants now rely on reservists for all kinds of things, doctors, uh, air traffic controllers, uh, logisticians. Um, of course, reservists are people who have uh, regular jobs. They're, they're civilians the rest of the time. And, but under uh, law, the president can call them into service for up to two years, and he has the authority to call up to one million reservists. The last time this was done was in the Persian Gulf War. 265,000 troops were called up for the Persian Gulf War in 1991, those reservists uh, serving uh, in the Persian Gulf War. And just quickly, do you have any idea how many, uh, how many people we're talking about here that might be called up or where those people are? Well, there, it, there could be, uh, there's th it would be thousands of troops. I'm not sure if okay. it would be several thousand or up to tens of thousands. And they'd be all over the country. So uh, there's no particular units that, uh, ultimately, there would be particular units, but at least that, what we're, that we're hearing now that might be involved right. in this. Right. It could okay. be spread all over the country. Okay, Jamie, thanks. Jamie McIntyre at the Pentagon this evening updating uh, that. That would be a very expensive proposition and would just add to the price tag of what is already an extraordinarily expensive tragedy. Um, and I don't honestly believe that we hear numbers uh, 20 billion, 30 billion, anyone really knows. We're about 43 minutes past 10 o'clock Eastern time. For those of you who might just be joining us, we'd like to update you briefly on where we have been tonight. As Jamie McIntyre just reported, President Bush is considering activating some military reserve units for the first time since the Persian Gulf War. They would be used to assist in emergency response efforts. Congress has already agreed to double the $20 billion. Uh, the White House has requested to pay for the recovery and the disaster relief area, so that's moving through the Congress now. Three New York City, uh, the three major New York City airports were closed again tonight after several security-related incidents, including the arrest of a person reportedly carrying a fake pilot's ID. And Kelly Arena at the Justice Department reports that it may be that these people tried to board planes on Tuesday, may have been a part of the broader conspiracy. In any case, they're in custody and they are being aggressively investigated tonight. And also, Northwest Airlines abruptly canceled a few flights it had scheduled tonight, saying it had information indicating it was not safe to fly. 
President Bush has declared Friday a national day of prayer and remembrance. Mr. Bush is scheduled to attend a prayer service here in New York City tomorrow. And a brief update of where we have been in the first 44 